Well, uh, good evening. Uh, my name's uh, Andy. I'm one of the church workers uh, at the church. If you're uh, watching online, uh, it's lovely to be with you. Um, if you've got a Bible, um, if you'd like to open it uh, back up to Matthew chapter 14, and we're going to be opening up the passage from verses 22 uh, through to 33. That's on page 820 uh, for the people here. So uh, we're going to be thinking this evening about this, this, this theme, testing Peter's faith. Uh, we're going to be thinking about it under, under four uh, main headings. Uh, the, the first one is going to be Jesus plans out the evening. Uh, the second one is the object of Peter's faith. And the third one is Peter's response. And then uh, the fourth and final is how all that we have looked at uh, leads to Peter worshipping the Saviour King. So uh, the, the, the first thing we're going to think about is just how Jesus plans out the evening. As Simon said, this comes straight after the feeding of the 5,000. And uh, Matthew tells us that it, it was getting dark in verse 15. It was evening. And we see straight away in verse 22 that Jesus does three things. So the first thing that Jesus does is that he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. The second thing that Jesus does is that we see him sending away, uh, dismissing the crowd uh, who had just enjoyed this wonderful picnic, uh, which was provided by, in a sense, this little boy with his five loaves and two fishes, which Jesus uh, turned into a feast. And then thirdly, the third thing that we see Jesus doing in verse 23 is he went up on to the mountain by himself to pray, to pray alone to his father. And this is the, the setting for this episode in, in Matthew's gospel. All of these uh, people are in the right place at the right time in order for Jesus to do exactly what he has planned for the evening. The, the, the stage is set for Jesus to teach his disciples and to test their faith, especially Peter's faith. So Jesus plans out the evening. It's just good for us to have that in our minds as we go through this passage. Uh, the second thing is the object of Peter's faith, the Lord of creation. So we see in the second half of verse 23 that when Jesus is, is praying on the mountain, that Matthew, one of the disciples, uh, tells us that the, the boat is now a, a long way away uh, from the land. And we, we know from, from John's gospel in chapter 6 that they were at least three to four miles away. That's uh, six kilometers now, Matthew really describes now in verse 24 personally what it was like to be on that boat. Remember that the gospel writer, Matthew, he was a former tax collector. He was one of Jesus' followers, and he was there that night. And Matthew tells us that the boat is being beaten. And you can also translate that word as being tossed about. He's saying the boat is getting uh, thrown about all over the place. You can also use the word tortured as well as he tries to just uh, describe the terrible conditions that they were in. In verse 24, he, he, he says that the wind was against them. It was against them in the direction that they were going in other words, they were going straight on into the wind. And the wind was causing these waves to, to push against the boat and to smash over the front of it, which the disciples felt the full impact of. If you've ever been in a boat and um, you, you, you've, you've had that experience, you, you know what it feels like. 
But Matthew then informs us in verse 25 that it was the fourth watch of the night. And the fourth watch is, is a kind of time period that the Romans use, that Matthew is using here. And this is between the time of 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning, the fourth watch. And that means that the disciples have been out. We don't know exactly for how long. We don't know exactly when they left um, the shore, the beach. But it might have been for maybe five hours, maybe six hours, maybe more. But they're, they're, they're really tired. They're really exhausted. And Matthew tells us at this point that Jesus came to them. Verse 25. And that he, he did this in verse 26 by walking on the sea. And when the disciples see him walking on the sea, they are terrified. Literally, that their spirits were struck with dread. They, they were disturbed emotionally at what they were seeing. And so out of their fear, they, they were crying out, they, they think that they have, have seen a ghost in verse 26. For them, it was just not possible that a man could walk on water. They cannot imagine that this is Jesus. This was just not their first guess in their desperation. But Jesus, who is the object of their faith, is showing them something about himself. And it is deeply unsettling and uncomfortable for Peter and the disciples because they're terrified. Jesus is showing them that he is the Lord of creation. By walking on the stormy sea, which the Bible often associates with confusion and chaos, Jesus is demonstrating that he has authority over the sea that they are on. But there is something so much more here. All through Matthew's gospel, Jesus has been showing his authority over all creation. There's been several miracles. Just before this, there's been the feeding of the 5,000. There's been Jesus uh, healing people who had physical problems. There's been Jesus casting out demons and evil spirits. And these miracles, they witness to the fact that something remarkable, something huge is happening. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus says this. Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is where God the Father rules through his king on earth over all creation. And all these miracles in Matthew's gospel, through all of these miracles, Jesus is, 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 is saying and he's showing something to, to the disciples of the characteristics of this kingdom. He's giving them a taster of, of what it is like and what one day, when it is completely established, what it will be like. God has sent his son to establish this kingdom so that he would bring all creation to its intended goal. What is the intended goal? 
Hold your breath. It is to bring all creation back to what it was meant to be. It is nothing less than the renewal of the whole universe. When all creation will in the future live happily under the happy rule of God's king, when righteousness and peace and, and, and joy will, 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 will coexist, in the new heavens and the new earth, then will God's kingdom be established. Then will it, it, it will have reached its goal. And Jesus will, will do this through the salvation of a, a sinful people by him dying on the cross And he will be bringing uh, lives of people, lives of people who have had their lives ripped apart by sin, who have been lost in, in, in the darkness and have been without hope. And Jesus has come into the world to, to bring them back and he will heal them and he will transform them and he will make them citizens of this amazing heavenly kingdom. And Jesus is that that promised king, that son of David, that Messiah who will bring this kingdom to its purpose. If you're not excited, brothers and sisters, about this, you're not going to get excited um, about anything. It's wonderful. And as Jesus is walking on the water, this is a taster of what is to come. Jesus is challenging their small ideas and and my small idea and your small idea of of who he is. He's given them a far greater, more glorious picture for their eyes to feast upon the object of their faith. And he is, he is the object of your faith. But the other object of of faith that I'd just like us to consider is is, uh, the object of Peter's faith, that is, is is the word of God. You see, in their fear, when they're, they're on this boat and they are absolutely terrified, in verse 27, Matthew tells us, immediately Jesus spoke to them. And Jesus says three separate things here. He says, Take heart. And you can put it like this. Continually be of good comfort. And the other thing that he also says is, is do not be afraid. And the basis for these commandments is this. He says, it is I. And the reason why the disciples can be of good comfort and not be struck with fear is because of what Jesus is saying and how these words, they hold such weight and promise because of the person who is saying them. Literally, it is I translates as this, I. I. I am. And and this reminds us of the Old Testament, doesn't it? Where Moses stood in front of the burning bush before the God of Israel who, who said this, I am who I am. Or as we read before in in Job, he is the one who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. This is the one who is speaking to them and and saying, it's okay. You're all right. You don't don't need to be afraid. You can can be of good comfort because it's me. I, I am. But let's just think about this uh, response 
of Peter, response of Peter. We're going to look, about, look at this in, in two parts. We're going to think about the courageous faith that he shows firstly. We see this in verse 28. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And in verse 29, Peter hears this voice. Imagine him standing on the boat and he hears a voice from out in the sea. And the voice says this, come. And Jesus responds to what Peter says in verse 29. And he, he, he gets himself out the boat while the sea, sea is still raging. And he, he walks on the water toward Jesus. And Peter, more than anyone, he knows that, that what the sea can be like. He's an experienced fisherman. He knows how dangerous it is. And at, at this stage in the night, it, it's, it's, it's quite pro, um, probably quite, quite dark. And he, he probably can't see all, all of, of, of who this person is. Who's calling him? But Jesus' faith is not blind. Sorry, Peter's faith is not blind. It rests firmly and confidently upon the words of Jesus and the person of Jesus who has said them. Jesus, the, the king of creation, the king of the kingdom of God, and in, 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 in Peter putting his trust in Jesus, Peter really is a, a wonderful model example of a, a disciple by taking Jesus at his word. If, if we can just uh, think about faith just for a, for a moment, faith is, is received by, by hearing God's word. Faith is given freely uh, to us by God. And it is through faith in, in Jesus that a person is, is saved. But we, we could also say that, that faith, or we could use the word trust, is, is active. It, it is something that, that, that we do. So trusting Jesus, it involves our will, it involves our convictions, it involves our whole person. And our, our, our faith uh, is nourished and it's strengthened through the word of God. Our faith leads us to live out what we believe to be true. And it rises above challenging circumstances. So faith says, I, I might feel afraid. I might be down and depressed. My life might seem just so overwhelming right now. But I will believe your word, Jesus. And for us here this evening, there might be people here who have challenging circumstances. That means as opening God's word or, or hearing the preached word and, 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 and hearing a truth or, or a promise and, and, and saying, despite these challenging circumstances that I am in, I will trust what Jesus says here. And therefore, I will choose to do this. Of course, all of this is completely dependent upon the grace of God. We desperately need the Holy Spirit's help to trust Jesus. But the gospel, writer, the gospel writers tell us that our Father is so willing to give us the Holy Spirit to help us. Well, let's just think of the other side of this, weak faith. So the other side of Peter's response, weak faith. And we, we see this in, in verse 30, when Peter sees that the strong wind, which is causing the mighty waves, he, he fears. But it's not just a, a quick glance. It's an ongoing stare at the waves. And this fear, it, it causes him to, to sink down. Verse 30. He 
He loses sight of what Jesus has said. And who really is standing with him on the Sea of Galilee? And all of this causes him to cry out in verse 30, Lord, save me. And while standing on on the water, Jesus reaches out his hand. He takes hold of Peter. And he sums him up really in, 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 in that moment. And he says to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, let's just think about this. Little faith or weak faith, as I've termed it here, is, is not so much talking um, about the amount of faith that Peter possesses. Faith as small as, as a mustard seed can, can move mountains. It can, it can move uh, massive obstacles, that verse is saying. But what, what Jesus is saying here is, really, he's really talking about the quality of Peter's faith. Weak faith, if we could, could look at it and define it in its simplest form, can be summed up like this. It's choosing to not look at Jesus, but instead stare at the waves, at the problems, at the things are, that are causing you to fear. And the, the question that Jesus Ask the statement that Jesus says, it, it can seem quite direct, it can seem a bit harsh even, but behind this statement is the compassion and love of Jesus, where he wants to bring out into the open this weak faith that Peter has. So Jesus asks him, why, why, why do you doubt? And in other words, why do you doubt my word? Why do you doubt my authority, my mercy, and my grace? Why do you you doubt what I just said back then, Peter, to you? And Jesus knows the answer to his question. But so often when when you read questions in the Gospels, they're there to do one thing, and it's to make make us think. And, And here, Jesus wants to make Peter think. Why do we stare at our problems and and not look at Jesus? You see, the problem of the weakness of faith is is not with Jesus. It's not with the object of faith. It's found in Peter, and it's buried deep within the sinful hearts of you and me. I mean, just... Think about the situation. It is silly to look at the waves, to look at the problems when the Lord of creation is, is, is standing right in front of you. It's silly for us to look at our problems when Jesus has given us some such wonderful promises and he has proved himself well and truly. So why did Peter look away from Jesus and look at the waves? This is not a simple question to answer. I think there's three reasons and there's probably many, many more. And some of these reasons, they they overlap. And maybe in in some of these reasons, maybe you can see yourself in in some of them. I think the first thing is is because of the sin in his heart which caused him to have unbelief in Jesus. Secondly, Peter's knowledge of who Jesus was at this point was not completely was not complete, or it was it was loosely understood. And thirdly, as a result of this, of this kind of loose understanding of who Jesus was. Peter's faith did not have confidence or conviction in Jesus. It was faith, if I can use this expression, it was faith without teeth. And so Peter did not rest in the wonderful knowledge of of the mercy of the sovereign king who is always able to help him.
And there will be different people in this room this evening and watching online as well who struggle with maybe one or maybe all of these areas. Maybe not all of the time, but for many of us, there, there are just ongoing struggles. And I, and, and I put myself in, in that category as well. But we shouldn't, in a sense, just uh, put that underneath the carpet and just pretend it's not there. It's good to acknowledge when we ha- have, have issues and have problems and have sin in our lives. We, we can confess it and we can deal with it. So maybe there are people here and people online who are, are staring at the waves in their lives. You're, you're frustrated because you're not in school. Maybe work is just really difficult at the moment. Or maybe you can't get work. Maybe you, you, you're lonely. Maybe there's a, a, a physical problem that, that you have that you're, you're really worried about and you keep on thinking about it. Maybe you want to be married, but, but it hasn't happened for you. Maybe you are married and, and things are just cold and, and they've just been difficult for just so, so long. Maybe you're checking BBC News every, every hour just looking at the COVID news and, and just you're obsessed with it almost and you're staring at it. Can I just say something just in real, in real love and as a person who struggles with this area as well, let's not stare at the problem. <laughs> but let's look to our King, Jesus. Let's stare at him. But I think there's a tension here, though, because after this event, you read Matthew's gospel, we know that Peter, he messes up again in this area. He denies Jesus, he fears other people, he denies him, and he runs off. We know in Galatians that Peter makes a mess of it again because he fears when the Jews turn up and the apostle Paul has to rebuke him. It's an ongoing problem for Peter, isn't it? And, and, and to be quite honest, this is going to be a tension which we're going to face for the rest of our lives, brothers and sisters, where we, we, we one moment we show courageous faith, but then two seconds later, we're, we're just showing weak faith. And we, we just got to be real with ourselves. That, that's what I'm like. That's what you're like. And I'm not saying don't make every effort to, to really have courageous faith and to cry out to God for mercy. Absolutely do that. But let's just be real about something. We need a savior, don't we? Because our faith isn't good enough. We need need someone who's better than ourselves. We need Jesus Christ. Like Peter, we need Jesus. And that's where really this kind of ends up. (laughs) Peter's worship of the savior king. In verse 32, they get back into the boat and, and the wind, it, it just stops. Everything calms down. And in verse 33, it's, it's just wonderful, isn't it? Matthew just tells us that those in the boat worshipped him. And they worshipped him saying this. This is part of their worship. You are the son of God. They see something more now of the one who stands with them on the boat in the Sea of Galilee. This trial of faith has taught Peter and the rest of the disciples something about Jesus that they would never have known unless they went through that stormy night. What does this mean, though, when they say, you are the Son of God? Son of God does not always refer to to deity, to Jesus being God, although that is true. But it also uh, refers, and I think this is the case in Matthew's gospel, to the Messiah. 
The, the Messiah is the promised son of David, God's king, who has come to establish uh, the kingdom of heaven, who has authority over all creation. <laughs> but at the same time, he also saves those whose faith is not perfect and those who doubt He held out his hand to Peter to save Peter and he demonstrated his his wonderful grace toward him. And this is what causes Peter and the disciples to worship him. It's the glorious Christ. And all of this event, as we read it in, in, in this chapter, we, we don't know exactly when Peter was, was saved, when he was converted. We don't know if it was in this incident or, or before it. But we do know this. Jesus has not just saved Peter from drowning, but with that little faith, Peter has been rescued from judgment, from the fires of hell and this, this miracle, it, it really just points to that reality. The one who they worship is the Savior King. He is the Messiah who left heaven's throne. And he came down to our world of chaos and confusion. And he walked with us. And he lay his life down on the cross on a Roman cross and he he took the sin he took the punishment that we deserved he destroyed the greatest enemy of death through this atoning death on this cross and then he rose again from the dead three days later and and this saviour king he's alive today (laughs) And he's in heaven right now, sat at the right hand of the throne of God. And he tells you right now, if you're watching this, and you are not a Christian, to repent. That means to turn around from the life that you are living. From from really just looking to yourself and trusting in yourself. and, and, And trusting entirely in Jesus. That means taking your whole life and 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 just Put your whole weight on Jesus, who he is. You might not understand everything about him, but you can know this, that he can save you. He can save you completely from judgment. And he will bring you through because he is God's king. He is the son of God. And right now he holds out his hand to you like he held out his hand to Peter. <laughs> And just as he he called him out on the boat, he says to you, come. Will you hear his call and respond to him? Now just as we close, just for us us as Christians, just to think about. I think this is a remarkable passage and a remarkable challenge as we live in the tension of faith. (laughs) We have our plans, don't we? The disciples had their plans. I can imagine that they wanted to get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee after a long day with Jesus. And they were looking for an easy ride, but it didn't happen. We have our plans, but God has his plans. And he is working through his son, Jesus, by the power of his Holy Spirit in in your life ordering events in order to test you, in order to shape you. But but why though? (laughs) Why is he doing all of that? Because so often we we, we think all about how it's affecting us and and my own life and my own little box. But but listen listen to why, why God is really doing it, why Jesus is really doing it. It's all for his glorious purpose, which you can be a part of. 
It's the increase of God's kingdom in the nations, in the UK, in Coventry. Let's go local. It's in Hillfields right now. And that increase means the redemption, the, the buying back, the rescue of sinners, of drug dealers, of prostitutes, of people who think that they have their lives all together, rich people in the city center. It's those people that you can be a part of in this wonderful kingdom work, which is eventually going to lead to the renewal of the whole universe which is going to be transformed into the new heavens and the new earth. And just as they worshipped on the boat, so we, as we are leaving this evening, you don't have to skip down the road if you don't want to, but really we should also just, as we are tested, as we are being shaped, the eye of faith, praising God for what he is doing in our lives, for his purposes the extension of his kingdom for this amazing, glorious future. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a wonderful purpose to be a part of? An amazing kingdom which will impact eternity. Amen.